Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Abia Gilio Kako, and I am a senior manager for program applications at Thermo Fisher Scientific. So we all know that we're still emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on all areas of life and health is still being felt around the world. So today we'll discuss the impact of the pandemic on HIV care and treatment um, and how we can get back on track to achieving the UNAIDS 2030 target. We'll hear perspectives from Brazil, from Nigeria, South Africa, and from Uganda. So just before we um, go ahead, I will just remind everyone about the UNAIDS target and how we got here today. In 2016, countries around the world agreed to achieve or to walk towards the fast track um, target of 1999 by 2020. And this meant that by 2020, 90% of people living with HIV would know their status. 90% of those who were diagnosed with HIV infection would receive sustained antiretroviral therapy. And 90% of those who are receiving antiretroviral therapy would achieve viral suppression. In addition to that, there'll be 500,000 fewer infections, um, fewer new HIV infections, as well as zero discrimination. So the 2020 targets were a preamble to the 2030 targets. Um, and the 2030 target was to end the, epi the epidemic of HIV AIDS um, as part of the UN AIDS, um, the Sustainable Development Goals, specifically goal three. So if we look at where we are today globally in terms of our progress towards this target, we would remember that COVID-19 began at the end of 2019, and by the end of 2020, these were the, um, the progress that the world had made in terms of the 1990 targets, and we see that we missed this 2020-1990 um, targets where 84% of people living with HIV knew their status by 2020, and this left more than 27% of people living with HIV who were not on treatment, and roughly about a third with unsuppressed viral load. And UNAIDS report says that this gaps are even larger for subpopulations of children, um, young people, and men. So today we're gonna hear from we're gonna hear from four speakers who are representatives of their countries, and they're gonna talk about the impact of the pandemic on this 1990 target and HIV drug resistance in their countries and in their regions. They're gonna uh, tell us about some practices that were implemented to deal with the, the, the disruption of care and treatment during the pandemic. And we'll also discuss some key transferable lessons that were learned um, in this countries. And um, as countries look beyond COVID-19 towards achieving the 95, 95, 95, 2030 targets, what can be done and what can be adopted across the world. And um, just disclose that all speakers participating in today's symposium were provided an honorarium by Thermo Fisher for their participation today. And without further ado, I'll introduce the speakers to us today. And we're going to be hearing first from Professor Carlos Brites. Um, Dr. Brites is a professor of infectious diseases um, at the School of Medicine at Federal University of Bahia in Brazil. Dr. Brites has been involved in several clinical trials in HIV and has co-authored over 190 scientific papers. He was the editor-in-chief of the Brazilian Journal of Infectious Diseases from 20, 2009 to 2016, and he's an editorial board member of current HIV research journal. And so without further ado, I invite Professor um, Carlos to give us his presentation. Thank you, Obi. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? Sure. 
Well, first, I, I thank the organizers for the opportunity to share some data on the, the impact of COVID-19 on HIV care in Brazil. This is my conflict of interest. Next, please. I will start the, the, the presentation showing that uh, the number of uh, people living with HIV linked to care uh, increased from 2019 to 2021, as you can see in the right side of the slide. However, the number of uh, dispensation, uh, the number of uh, uh, drugs delivered for uh, such patients decreased in the same period of time from almost 5 million doses to about below 4 million doses. It is uh, probably an, an impact of uh, the COVID pandemic making some people unable to take the, the medication to go to the pharmacy to uh, refill the prescription. And on the right, in the left side, you can see the, the number of COVID in Brazil. We had uh, over 30 million cases with over 60, six, uh, 664,000 people dead. And the key, which uh, means uh, an incidence per 100,000 of 14.5. Next, please. And do, next slide, please. Uh, one way to look at the numbers and see how the, the pandemic affect the HIV care, excuse me, one slide behind, what is to evaluate in the number of uh, tests that were performed for follow-up of HIV patients. The, the slide before this sh would show, yes. Here you can see in the upside of the slide, the number of CD4 cells count performed during the pandemic. And you can see uh, in the dark blue, a sharp decrease in the number of tests performed on April, from April uh, 2020 until the end of the year. And uh, the same could be observed for uh, viral load, HIV viral load performed in Brazil that year. We see that uh, in 2020, there was a, a partial recovery of the numbers, but the numbers still are below that observed in 2019. Next one, please. Uh, next slide, please. It seems there is a delay. Yeah. This picture shows the number of people starting antiretroviral therapy during, during the pandemic period. And again, we see in the dark blue, a decrease, a sharp decrease in the number of people are starting the retroviral therapy if you compare 2020 to 2019. And again, a slight recovery of the numbers in 2021, but they are still below that observed in 2019 and pre-pandemic period. Next, please. And uh, this impact can be also observed in the number of uh, new HIV case reported by the Brazilian Ministry of Health over time. We see a decrease in the number from 2017 to 2019, but it is more marked uh, from 2019 to 2020. If, and if you expand the numbers observed in 2021 up to the uh, June, we see that uh, it will, will give us a total of uh, about 8,000 people, new cases diagnosed in that period of time, which means half of those observed and uh, detected in 2018, 2019. It means uh, a potential impact on the first 90 to 95 uh, target uh, units because the number of new cases are decreasing over time. Next slide, please. We can see also another effect of the pandemic in the delay in artery refill in patients comparing the pre-pandemic and the, during the pandemic period. In 2019, only 14% of people on antiretroviral therapy had a delay higher than uh, 30 days in receiving the antiretroviral drugs. In 2020, there was an increase in 25% in this number. It means that 18% of people living with HIV on antiretroviral therapy had a delay uh, higher than uh, 30 days in refilling the antiretroviral drugs. Next slide, please. 
This can show uh, one way the Brazilian Ministry of Health tried to minimize this problem. At the beginning, before the pandemic period, we had uh, most of the people, 72%, uh, had a refill of antiretroviral drugs up to 30 days. And then it was increased to uh, almost uh, 60%. And in 2021, only 40% of people uh, took the, the antiretroviral drugs for a, a shorter period of time. Most of them received for two or three months. It means less need to go to the, the health service to take the, the, the drugs and uh, could improve the, the adherence of people uh, to therapy. Next time, please. Next slide, please. The same profile, the same pattern of a, a decrease in the number of cases we can see for PrEP and cause exposure, uh, prophylaxis, dispensing during pandemic. We see again that uh, 2020 was the most affected year, and there is a coincidence of the peak of the, the, the case you can see in the, the figure below, and uh, the decrease, the sharper decrease in the number of people taking drugs for prevention during that period of time. Next, please. Here we can see the proportion of people studying therapy with uh, CD4 counting over uh, 500 cells and the proportion of viral suppression. Regarding the number of people starting therapy early in the, 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 the course of disease, there was a uh, stability over time. And uh, we can see the same in the number of proportion, the proportion of people on, on antiretroviral therapy presenting with viral suppression, except for a uh, decrease that is perceivable from 2020 to 2021 among women. We know that women are more vulnerable and uh, or, uh, has more, they have more problems on uh, adherence to therapy. And uh, it seems that the pandemic affected in a unequal way of men and women regarding uh, virus suppression. Next slide, please. The adherence, however, seems to be on the rise in the, the, the last three years. You can see that from 2019 to 2021, the numbers in, uh, show an increase in the, the adherence rate, as well as the, the last to follow up was uh, decreasing over time. And we can see that according to the official data, the patient, the proportion of patients with adequate adherence was higher in the last three years. Next, please. Next slide. Uh, here we can see the proportion of people lost to follow up by year and sex. And again, we have an instability from 2020 and 2021. 2019 and 2021, showing that uh, probably the impact of uh, the pandemic on this specific aspect were not uh, that important, at least for uh, on the official data. Next slide, please. We can see also the same pattern in retention and care by uh, sex and aging them over time. From 2016 to 2019, we have an increase in retention in care and uh, for women, women and men and the general population are living with HIV. And it is stable in 2020. We have no data from 2021, but uh, probably there is no significant change in this period of time. Next slide, please. Here, we, we try to see, uh, to evaluate how the pandemic affects our patients in our AIDS clinic. And here you can see that the first, the first case of uh, COVID was detected in February 2020 in Bahia. So we have an increase, a peak of a uh, missing medical visit in the next two or three months. And again, it decreased over time, but it still uh, remained high until November when the number of the pandemic became uh, lesser than in, in the, the previous months. And uh, in 2021, we have uh, an oscillation, but again, when the pandemic peaks in uh, August, September, we have an increase in the number of, the proportion of patients missing medical visit, which of course is, has a, di a direct impact on the in such population. Next slide, please. 
We try to look at the, the uh, reasons for missing scheduled medical visit and 20, almost 40% of patients reported missing medical visit during pandemic period. And the main reason for doing that was a fear of COVID contamination. Two thirds of patients did not show up because they are afraid of uh, contamination by COVID in this period of a pandemic. Next slide, please. Some additional findings. We noted an increase in the number of missing medical visits in the first month of 2021, 22, not captured by official report yet, as well as an increase in the number of adherent patients that stopped therapy during COVID-19 related factors, especially uh, difficult to move to the, the, the pharmacy. A sharp decrease in the number of new AIDS cases from 2019 to 2022. And uh, we believe that there is, uh, is not a, a, a same pattern across the country. We probably have very marked difference between uh, sites in big cities and small cities and undeveloped regions. And we have uh, heard from uh, uh, colleagues from other cities and regions that this situation can be much more uh, uh, significantly affected by COVID. The adherence, the medical visit is, uh, and uh, probably in different places of the, the, the county, there is different this situation. It means that uh, we do not know yet the impact on the HIV resistance because uh, there is no data on that, but probably will be significant and will appear in the next few months or next few years. Next slide, please. And uh, as a sort of conclusion we can take from this data, According to the official data, the adherence pattern to antiretroviral therapy was not significantly changed during the pandemic. But we believe that the increase in the duke supply duration was important too to minimize adherence problems. However, missing medical visits were clearly associated with the peaks of COVID-19 pandemic, especially in the first year of, the, of COVID. And, uh, to date, we have no way to measure the impact of pandemic and consequent increase in frequency of missing visits on adherence and uh, on emergence of viral resistance. Uh, we believe that it, we will need more uh, investigation, more uh, deeper investigation that at the national level to uh, know exactly how was the impact of this uh, pandemic on the all these markets of uh, HIV care and especially specifically on the uh, units target for 2030. Thank you for your attention. So thank you so much, um, Professor Carlos, for that presentation. And right now we'll move to our second speaker, um, Dr. Olabanjo Ogunshola. Dr. Ogunshala is the Associate Director and Head of Prevention and Community Directorate at APIN Public Health Initiative. APIN Public Health Initiative is a PEPFA implementing partner in Nigeria. And in Dr. Ogunshala's role as the Head of Prevention and Community Directorate, he provides technical and strategic leadership for HIV program implementation activities across several states and locations in Nigeria. And so right now, I'll hand over to Dr. Ogunshola for his presentation. Yeah, uh, thank you, Dr. Obi. And thank you, Professor Carlos, for sharing the perspective from Brazil. So I'll be sharing the uh, impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the UN 95 in Nigerian program experience. Next slide, please. I would like to declare conflict of interest disclosure that uh, I was given an, an honorary for this. So despite the COVID-19 pandemic, Nigeria made progress towards the UN 95-95 goal. Uh, in 2018, Nigeria was at 67, 53, 42%, uh, looking at the 95-95. But in the year 2020, we moved to 90% for the first 95, 86 for the second, and 72 for the third 95. So if you look at this, despite, 
the pandemic in the year 2019 and 2020, we made progress. Next slide, please. So the COVID-19 pandemic story in Nigeria, uh, the first case uh, of COVID-19 pandemic uh, was on 27th February, 2020. And within a short period, it spread across all states in the country. As of 26 April 2022, Nigeria has tested over 5 million with over 250 confirmed cases. And the case fatality rate in Nigeria is about 1.2%. Next slide, please. With the advent of COVID-19 vaccine, uh, Nigeria has partially vaccinated 20% of the eligible clients and has fully vaccinated 13.3% as of April 2024, 2022. Next slide, please. The COVID-19 pandemic in Nigeria triggered massive contraction in client volume in health facilities. And this also had an impact on the HIV case finding and retention on treatment. Uh, if you look at the figure here, uh, this is just showing experiences from two states in Nigeria. Uh, at the scare of COVID-19 in February 2020, uh, there was a plunge in the number of new cases identified for HIV and in the number of positives to identified. And of course, there were a population-wide anxiety and concern and there were structural lockdown in the country in which movements were restricted and even facilities were only offering emergency services. Next slide, please. However, what was the experience and impact? For us in the HIPIN Public Health Initiative, uh, we are a PEFA implementing partner and currently one in every five people living with HIV in Nigeria are receiving care in our supported facilities. Next slide, please. So looking at the first 95, in the year 2018, uh, Nigeria conducted the National AIDS Indicator and Impact Survey, and that actually brought to the fore the current status of HIV infection in Nigeria and how the program needs to move forward. And there come COVID-19 pandemic in 2019. Uh, for the first 95, there was a shift to the community to deepen HIV case finding. Prior to this, um, more efforts were concentrated in the facilities. So if you look in our program, you see a gradual increase in the proportion of HIV testing done in the community. Next slide. And this is showing comparing the yields from the facility testing and the community. And if you look at when COVID-19 was at its peak, a lot of efforts were in the community and community was actually yielding quite a high number of uh, HIV positive. Uh, you can see that at a certain time, uh, we were at 8%, 9% positivity yield. However, as things is up, it dovetailed down to meet uh, the facility uh, testing yielding numbers. Next slide. So what strategies uh, are being implemented at the facility or in the community? Well, the country is moving, is implementing risk-based testing using the risk transfusion tool. And that has really improved uh, testing efficiency and also improve uh, yield from testing. So we are more efficient in the use of resources. Then we've also intensified in this testing, both at the facility and the community, and the use of data, recently it map to target location of active transmission to improve HIV case detection. Next slide. Now looking at the second 95 issues about retention and treatment uh, in our program, if we look at uh, a trend analysis as shown here, between October 2018 and September 2021, you can see that we had more people 
on treatment uh, living with uh, HIV, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. And one of the strategies to, to keep more people on treatment is the multi-month dispensing. Uh, so this figure is showing that as we move in the, during the pandemic, there were more PLHIV who are placed on six month drug. That means they, they have drugs they can use for six months at home. And the impact of restriction in movement, uh, structural lockdown will have minimal impact on them and hence they are retained on treatment and they're able to achieve virus suppression. Next slide, please. So for us to optimize retention, key strategies is to work with the community, with the network of people living with HIV, then to implement case management team structure and to reduce interruption in treatment. Uh, this has really worked. Then, they, of course, the differentiated service delivery, in which people are at the center of the services they are receiving. So services are taken to people where it's convenient, and, and this has helped them to be retained in care. Next slide, please. Now, looking at the third 95, ensuring viral load coverage and suppression. The COVID-19 pandemic had impact on commodity logistics and lab operations. Uh, the key issues were inter and intra-state movement restriction. There were also delay in shipments of commodities reagents uh, due to flight disruption, commodity shortage due to production cut by vendors. Uh, and this actually had impact uh, on after 95, they were stopped out of PCR commodities and this, there are also prolonged turnaround time for sample movement and result return, uh, which also accumulation of, uh, of samples, backlog of samples, because there are no reagents and commodity to process them. Uh, and there are also delay in access of engineers which, to come out to site to resolve uh, equ equ equipment faults. But what are the interventions that were put in place? Uh, there are sample routing to mega labs, uh, results were returned using, using courier services. And there was the activation of the laboratory information management system, which is an electronic method of downloading results at the facility. So the results don't need to move from the lab to the facility. Next slide. And this intervention actually yielded results that despite the COVID-19 pandemic in our program, we can see a progressive increase in viral load coverage and suppression, even during the pandemic. If you look at 2019, 2020, if you compare, you can see there's a steady progress in viral load coverage and suppression. And at the end of Q1, 2022, we've achieved viral load coverage and suppression of 95%. Next slide, please. So what are the strategies put in place to achieve 95% viral coverage and suppression? One, we can liken it under these three category, the pre-tracking intervention, the tracking intervention, and the post-tracking intervention. The pre-tracking intervention has to do with educate, educating the patients, and deploying viral load champions as gatekeepers at the entry and exit point. Then the generating line listing of active clients will require viral load bleeding. And the tracking interventions involve using of peer, the case management team, the facility tracking team, institution, institutionalizing cluster bleeding in actual rich communities so that uh, even bleeding for viral load can be done in the communities. We don't actually need to wait for them to come to the facilities. And the post-tracking intervention is the use of the laboratory information management system, which has helped to reduce the turnaround time from results getting from the lab to the facility. Next slide, please. So what are the key lessons learned uh, at, re at relates uh, to the impact of COVID-19 on HIV programming? 
One, we've learned that integrating routine vaccination services into ART services have helped to improve vaccination coverage, and it has also helped to improve HIV case identification. Then that differentiated service delivery is the way to go because this has helped to improve patient outcome in terms of retention, in terms of viral load coverage, in terms of viral load suppression. And the use of technology, phone call, WhatsApp group, SMS, has helped to improve patient monitoring. We've also learned that multi-month dispensing is key to improving retention and suppression. Then for the healthcare workers, we've learned that the virtual platform is a good tool to build capacity of healthcare workers and that the COVID-19 pandemic has overall improved the standard safety precaution and hygiene of health facilities and of our healthcare workers. Next slide. This good uh, result or mitigation of the impact of COVID-19 on the UN AIDS 95-95-95 was done in collaboration and support from different stakeholders. The funding agency, PEFA, the network of people living with uh, HIV AIDS in Nigeria, implementing partners like APIN, the government of Nigeria, the community itself, Global Fund, and of course, we need to thank the healthcare workers who have worked tirelessly, tirelessly during this period to provide services to our, our patients. Next slide. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ogunshola. Um, without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Mandisa Dukashi. Mandisa is the founder and director of HIV Survivors and Partners Network in South Africa. And for over 15 years, she has worked in the field of HIV program design, management, and system strengthening. She is a U equals U pioneer in South Africa and a co-founder of U equals U Africa Forum. U equals U is a movement that is led by people living with HIV across nine African countries. Mandisa is also a member of several advisory, of several key advisory boards on HIV prevention and control. And so we welcome Mandisa to give us her presentation. Um, thank you so much, OB. Um, I want to declare that I received an honorarium to be a speaker and I don't have any conflict of interest. And um, I'll be presenting, um, uh, the overview is COVID-19 impact on HIV services, human resource and infrastructure, um, the UNA's 1990-90 progress. Um, I think um, during the opening, OB did it, um, highlight on what 1990-90 are. And I'll also talk about data, uh, data before and after COVID, HIV drug resistance. Um, next slide, please. Um, the pandemic mainly impacted HIV educational testing programs and the provision of protection methods, um, especially during lockdown, because people could not um, travel to access the services and that most of the services are happening in communities. Um, in South Africa, air provision was generally maintained during um, the 2020 COVID-19 lockdown. And what I think what also helped is the decanting or decentralization of HIV services, especially ARVs pro uh, provision, um, because uh, people um, collected ARVs in communities. They, had, they did not have to go to facilities. But HIV testing, which is mostly community-based, home-based, um, it was severely affected. And ARV initiation were heavily impacted as well. In other countries like Kenya and Nigeria, up to 50% of people with HIV could not have their ARVs um, supplies. Uh, next slide, please. 
And when it comes to human resource, commodities and infrastructure, health facilities experienced staff shortages when facing the surge of COVID-19. So the situation was further complicated by staff absenteeism. Health workers were very sick because of COVID, because as you know, that they, are first, they were first line workers during the, the COVID-19 um, um, pandemic. And some had to quarantine because of exposure to the virus and in total 67 percent of facilities across africa were affected and there were spot checks that were done in health facilities and our data proved that um 24 countries in africa and only uh, only 38 of health facilities had protective material that is masks disinfectant gloves and hand sanitizers and across all health workers and only 61 percent had surgical masks Remember, these people that we're talking about are frontliners and they were engaging with patients on a daily basis. And only 8% of facilities across Africa could carry out a COVID-19 PCR test and 37% could prepare samples. Some countries had to use um, PCR, HIV PCR machines to test for COVID. That is redirection of infrastructure and, and commodities. Next slide, please. Um, what was the impact um, in the, on the 1990-90 targets? Um, I think, um, as I was saying, that we all know what the 1990-90 meant before COVID. And in the continent, or um, in, in Africa, Eastern and Southern Africa, um, as of 2020, 20.6 20 million people were living with HIV just before COVID. And out of the 20.6 million people with HIV, 72% <clears throat> of those people had access or were on ARVs or antiretrovirals. And of the 20.6 million people with HIV, 65% had viral suppression. I'm looking at the, the, the numbers below. Um, I'm overlooking the one above because if you look at those above, you may think that we succeeded and achieved, but interpretation of those is not looking at the total number of people that are living with HIV. That's why I'm, I'm concentrating on the numbers below. Next slide, please. So what, how, what, what, was, what was the scenario or the picture before COVID and after COVID? Um, according to paper, paper data, HIV tests before COVID per quarter was at 3.7 million. And that number decreased by close to a million after COVID to 2.7 million. And the positivity rate per quarter before COVID was, it was at 164,000. And after COVID, it decreased by close to 60,000, um, the numbers of people that tested um, positive for HIV. ARV initiation, it was 89%. We're close to achieving the 90 target. This, uh, um, but uh, post COVID, that decreased to by 60 um, to 60%, the decrease of 30%. And imagine this is data that was presented eighty twenty one. We don't know what's the issue and the situation now. So uh, resources that were used for HIV that had to be redirected to COVID. PCR machine used for HIV viral load testing and able to rapid establishment of COVID to PCR testing, meaning a lot of um, uh, you know activities or tests that were supposed to be done for HIV could not. And gene sequences platforms established for HIV resistance testing were used for um, variant identification and clinical trial infrastructure for HIV vaccines pivoted to undertake COVID-19 um, vaccine trials. Next slide, please. So there was also a survey that was done by Human Research a Science Research Council in South Africa that um, discovered that 13% of people had no access to their chronic medication during lockdown. And the rapid assessment in Zambia um, in April 2020, just before COVID, I think it was a month after COVID was identified, find out that 90% of people with HIV attempting to get refill, it was the time where, you know, lockdown, I think it was in level five. Those people could not get a refill of their antiretrovirals. They could not actually access, some had a partial refill of their treatment. And the government prioritized intervention to control the spread of SARS, COVID, and less effort was put into ensuring continued of other health Health services, including delivery of HIV services. In May 2020, just two months after identification of COVID, World Health Organization survey in 13 African countries um, discovered that there were a lot of stockouts 
and especially with the first line drugs, risen being, including failure to supply. Remember, I think one of the speakers mentioned that the flights restrictions and, you know, and, and all that kind of thing really affected this particular um, uh, supply. The next slide, please. So, you know, I think there was, there's a lot of data that proves that a majority or some people with HIV are developing drug resistance. And it, um, this one in particular, I was conducted in South Africa in 2017 and it discovered that more than a quarter, 27.4 of virally unsuppressed um, respondent had viral resistance um, of HIV. So now lockdown happened. And we know there were a lot of gaps in terms of treatment access and all that. And some of people, some people could not have their viral load done, and drug resistance testing could not be done because infrastructure had to be used for COVID. So therefore, it's very clear that there will be more um, number of people increasing um, in uh, and developing drug resistance. So it is critical that the government recover plan should be ramped up and close monitoring of development of drug resistant HIV should be a top priority. Uh, routine viral load me measurements should be um, a main focus. Efforts to increase access to routine HIV drug resistant testing should be increased. This will enable, um, this will enable uh, more people, uh, sorry, my, there was an, a, a break in my network. This will enable more rapid response to emerging resistant pattern and prevent increase in acquired drug resistant cases, cases which were on the rise even before COVID. Next slide, please. Um, so this is my last slide. So UNAIDS reported that COVID-19 pandemic had seriously impacted the AIDS response and could um, disrupt it more. I think it was before, I think the first year. So a six months complete disruption in HIV treatment could cause more than 500,000 HIV deaths in the region over the next year, that is between 2021, bringing the region back to 2008 AIDS mortality level. Even a 20% disruption could cause an additional 110,000 deaths. So this is something that we really, really need to focus on as the region, because we need to mop up and look at them, actually, that go down to assessing the impact of COVID-19 and come up with uh, mitigation plans. And this is my last slide. Um, thank you so much uh, for listening. Over to you, Obi. Thank you so much, Mandisa. Um, so I will go ahead and introduce our fourth speaker. Our fourth speaker is Dr. C.C. Kitio Mutuluza. Um, she is a public health specialist and epidemiologist with over 29 years of experience with in HIV AIDS care, treatment, and research. Dr. Kitio is among the pioneers of antiretroviral therapy in Sub-Saharan Africa from 1992, and she has been at the forefront of scaling of care and treatment since 2003. Dr. Kitio is currently the executive director of the Joint Clinical Research Center in Kampala, Uganda. And so at this time, I will hand over to Dr. C.C. Kichu for her presentation. Thank you. I will talk about the state and role of HIV drug resistance testing for surveillance and patient management in Uganda and its relationship with achieving epidemic control country. This is my conflict of interest disclosure. So the wake up call to address HIV drug resistance for patient management, especially in low and middle income countries, only came after the HIV drug resistance HIV World Health Organization report in uh, 2017. And in this report, six of the 11 countries that had reported national HIV drug resistance survey data collected according to WHO guidelines had pretreatment HIV drug resistance equal to or above 10%. And Uganda featured prominently among these countries as can be shown here in blue. 
However, high levels of HIV drug resistance had already been detected in Uganda as part of the Pan-African Studies to Evaluate Resistance, codenamed PESA, which were conducted across 13 clinical sites in six African countries, starting from uh, 2009. So the highest HIV drug resistance rates were seen in Uganda, with in and out TI rates higher than 5%, across three sites that participated in this survey. And these are the high levels that were shown from the sites in, in Uganda. The same surveillance was done in the pediatric populations at the same sites as the adult surveillance from 2010. And uh, these are the sites as shown here. And this uh, surveillance recruited 317 pediatric patients who had a viral load done every six months. And similar to the adult population, pretreatment HIV drug resistance to in and out TIs, as shown in yellow here, was already above 5%. And in Imbale, this was the town shown in the previous slide, which is near the um, Kenya border. The uh, resistance was even more than 10%. So uh, the action taken to address the high HIV drug resistance to in and out TIs was the revised World Health Organization recommendations to use dotegravia best regimens in first and second line ART regimens. And these are excerpts from uh, the WHO guidelines. Addressing uh, the HIV drug resistance uh, at that time and now impacts directly on the third 95 goal or target of UNAIDS of having viral suppression, which in turn prevents uh, transmission of HIV. So Uganda, like all other countries, is working towards ending the HIV epidemic by addressing many facets of the HIV, but uh, including controlling viral load and HIV drug resistance. So uh, on the left-hand side, this graph shows uh, that by 2020, how Uganda was doing. There's been a steady decline in new infections, in AIDS-related deaths, and all-cause mortality along people, li people living with HIV. On the right-hand side, this is the projection that by 2020, if we continue to uh, put all resources and efforts are better aligned. By 2023, we uh, project to have HIV epidemic control attained. And this is when new infections are lower than all cause mortality among people living with HIV. Again, the UNAID strategy to end the AIDS epidemic includes the third 95 target of viral suppression and viral load monitoring, uh, which we are doing in the programs, is to detect early treatment failure and also development of HIV drug resistance. So uh, despite COVID-19, uh, in the last two years, Uganda has seen steady improvement in both viral load coverage and viral load suppression. As at the same time, we were seeing an increase in the transition of patients to dotegria based regimens as per the WHO guidelines. Uh, this slide shows a snapshot of COVID-19 trends in Uganda from 2020. Uh, the country had two lockdowns, and between the two lockdowns, that totals six months out of the 15 months shown on this slide. It's inevitable, therefore, 
uh, because this is about 40% of the total time uh, shown on the graph, it is inevitable that there were possible disruptions in the gains made in the roadmap to ending the HIV epidemic, which was fairly on course. And uh, this slide shows uh, that compared to the pre-pandemic baseline, which is the red dotted line, we saw a decline in all categories of patients enrolling on ART as new entrants. And uh, it, it can be seen from this slide that a lot of effort was being put on patients who were already enrolled on ART. So the numbers continued to uh, increase even during 2020, 2021, when we had COVID because of the several strategies and efforts put into place to ensure that patients access their treatment even during lockdown. However, a decline in the children accessing ART was seen. And traditionally, this is the age group with the biggest problem of adherence and possibility of developing HIV drug resistance. So this slide shows uh, the viral load tests done and also viral load suppression. The viral load tests, as you can see, fluctuated a lot during the past two years. Although viral load suppression among those tested is seen to increase. However, we don't know what is happening to those patients we can't reach to perform a viral load, whether in lockdown or not. Again, this slide, which is from PEPFA, summarizes sustained viral suppression at 96% with increasing numbers of patients starting dotegravia based regimens. And as shown in orange, there is emphasis and increasing multi-month dispensing to prevent ART interruptions and therefore sustain viral load suppression. So uh, while uh, the viral load suppression is high, we looked at HIV drug resistance prior to the national Dolce Gravia rollout in 2018 to establish a baseline of Dolce Gravia resistance and continue to monitor resistance so that we can inform the programs. And among the ART naive patients as seen on the upper graph, the first line and first line failures uh, on the lower graph, we did not see any resistance to the to the to Gravia. And this work was done in 2018. All the green uh, bars shows that these patients were susceptible to Dolce Gravia. Uh, in, the, in the same study, we also did not see any resistance to Dolteogravia in patients failing second line ART, as all of them were on uh, protease inhibitors based ART. So patients who were failing on integrase based regimen, and at the time we were using Rautegravia, already showed uh, high levels of uh, resistance and cross resistance actually to other um, integrase inhibitors which we were not using at the time like dotegravia yeah so um, this slide is data from a more recent work actually done in 2022 after the rollout of dotegravia and we see we had uh, Participants with a wide range of uh, ages and in green patients had been on treatment for varied time periods. And then uh, from this graph, we saw that we had adolescents and children failing on first line. We had patients failing on second line and also patients who were failing on third line. 
So uh, as per the indication on the previous slide for testing, uh, this drug resistance surveillance data is also used for patient management. So from this graph, we see that we have a fairly high level of resistance to Rautugravir, which has been used for some time now in the country, especially for patients who need third line. And uh, that resistance also shows that there is cross-resistance to Cabotegravir and Bictegravir, which have not been used in the country except under research settings, and the numbers that have taken it are very small. However, we see that resistance to dotegravia is still low, despite the rollout, uh, but we need to continue to uh, do surveillance and uh, so that we can inform our policy and also the program. So uh, we are continuing to do HIV drug resistance surveillance, and two studies are planned. Uh, one of them is for patients on the Otegravia who are failing with a viral load above 1,000 copies. And this work is going to be done at the UVRI. While we are also looking at another study of patients failing on the Otegravia but with low level viremia of 200 to 999 copies per ml. And the goal is to maintain doltegravir durability following the high pre-drug pre resistance that the country experienced with NNLTIs, but also to detect drug resistance mutations to doltegravir as early as possible and inform the ART program. So in summary, there is evidence of increasing HIV drug resistance to dotegravia from 2018 to present as the drug is being scaled up for first and second line treatment. Although this resistance is still low at the moment, this may affect gains made in HIV programming even during COVID-19 epidemic. So preventing and then ongoing monitoring and responding to this HIV drug resistance is critical to maintaining the current achievements, especially viral suppression, improving patient outcomes and guaranteeing uh, long-term sustainability of care and treatment programs. Thank you for listening to me. Um, So thank you so much, um, Dr. Sisi, for your presentation. And we will um, switch over right now to our panel discussion where we would um, engage all the speakers and talk a little bit more, dive deeper into some of their presentations and some of the findings that they um, talked about. And so I guess for the first question in the panel discussion, we all talked about a lot of practices that were implemented in the different countries um, to help counter the effect of COVID-19 and some people had great success. So amongst all the things that we talked about, if we have to look beyond COVID into things that we can retain in this country beyond COVID, what would be your top one or two things, one or two, um, things that were implemented in your country that we would say we can retain and would be sustainable beyond COVID. And so I will start from um, Dr. Ogunshala. Uh, thank you, Dr. Obi, for that question. But what I would say is that we need to keep the tempo in implementing differentiated service delivery uh, because we need to put people at the center of the services they, they need. Uh, one cap does not fit all. Uh, so people uh, have very, various needs, various challenges. So when we tailor our services to them, like we did during COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it will help us to retain people living with HIV in care, achieve viral load coverage and suppression. So, 
healthcare worker led group, community ART refill group, you know, community pharmacy group. Look about the multi month dispensing. These are key things that we've learned that, and I think we should keep on retain them, expand them as one of the key lessons from COVID 19 pandemic. Mm. Thank you so much, Joseph Unshola. So I really like the fact that you talked about differentiated service delivery, so focusing on people and what they need. Um, one of the things that Professor Carlos brought up was um, he, he talked about subpopulation. So he, there was um, something about women being lost to follow up um, differentially than other populations. He also talked about regional differences. And so I guess I will ask this question to Professor um, Carlos about how to actually address this inequalities that we see in different subpopulations and different um, um, regions. And just thinking through beyond COVID, what we've done before COVID is probably not enough if we want to achieve the 2030 um, goals that we set out to. So what can we do in addition to actually reach all the subpopulations and populations that are experiencing inequality in um, HIV care and treatment? Uh, I believe the, the, the main, one of the main challenges in uh, managing the, the HIV epidemic, not only in Brazil, but in several countries with similar characteristics, is uh, access. And uh, when we talk about access, access to prevention, especially, and uh, in this specific point, women are most vulnerable than men in general. And in Brazil, at least we we see a very uh, patriarchal society and uh, sometimes women have no, uh, no right access. It's not providing a good access to healthcare and uh, for uh, care in general. We, in, in a, a few years ago, we, we look at the number of people, of women, pregnant women uh, arriving at us, healthcare service for, with HIV and 25% of them in our state was late presenters, over 20, 22 weeks of gestation. It means probably no antenatal care, no access to health care in general. It, uh, I believe that the HIV epidemic affected in a disproportionate way women and men in Brazil and then many other uh, places. But here, specifically, I believe uh, to provide uh, equal access without many barriers that they face in the, uh, when they look for uh, healthcare would be the main challenge for our authorities. And uh, I believe that the, the decrease in the number of, uh, the proportion of women with viral suppression is different from women in that slide I showed. And uh, it, it means, there is probably many barriers we have to uh, tackle in order to provide uh, proper treatment for women and uh, access to therapy. Can you speak a little bit more about what can be done to actually achieve access for regions that are now um, different, that are differentially um, affected by HIV as well as you know, the added impact of COVID that, you know, we haven't yet seen and we will probably see them. Yes, you, Brazil is a, a continental country. It's a very large country with very uh, clear disparities. If you, if you go to the South region, we have a very developed society with access to many services that in the North, in Northeastern region, we, we lack uh, the same uh, pattern of uh, services. So in the north, in the Amazon region, it's very, very difficult to have a, a proper health care. The access to health services are very difficult. There is no road. Most of the, the transportation is by rivers. And uh, sometimes the next health care service is about five hours of boat. So uh, by boat, in the, the, it's uh, completely different if you go to the, the developed regions of the country. So, it's a big challenge because it was uh, a consequence of uh, decades of uh, differential approach for uh, development of these areas. So this kind of inequality will be hard to, to fight because it, it probably will take 
longer than uh, just providing uh, antiretroviral drugs, testing for HIV. And uh, so COVID uh, show well that uh, the disproportion between the, the, the access to care in the developed regions of the country and the underdeveloped regions like Amazon region, where the mortality rate was much higher than the other areas. So that's a, a big problem and uh, I do not see a easy solution in the short term. Probably would take decades to solve this uh, complex situation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, so I hear I hear a lot of multi-dimensional problems that you know we need to be addressed even beyond healthcare. Like we need to look beyond healthcare to other to work in, in collaboration with other ministries and other partners to actually address this um, problem of access, regional disparities in access. Um, so I will just ask my next question to Mandisa. Um, talking, thinking through. Um, what the government makes available. Um, Melissa mentioned about how COVID took over HIV um, technologies that were available. For example, um, PCR machines were now being used for COVID and so viral load and all that. And so now that we've transitioned, well, we're emerging or we're transitioning out of COVID. We haven't fully transitioned or we're coming out of COVID, there's been so much investment in COVID, so much investment in technologies on the ground, so much investment in training and all. And so, Melissa, I guess the question to you is, how can we leverage what has been invested and use it to advance HIV care and treatment in countries? Um, <clears throat> I believe over and above um, the resources that you are talking about, um, COVID has taught, uh, taught us communities and decision makers importance of collaboration and, um, and working together, focus, and that alone is something that we really need to look into when we have a similar goal because everyone else in communities and, and businesses and we're looking and working forward uh, towards uh, ending the, you know, the, the COVID-19, which is something that you really need to learn um, in, in, in terms of focus and on and resources, um, you know, there's a lot of infrastructure equipment that um, some, somehow was procured to respond to COVID. And now that we're really um, seeing the, the COVID-19 subsiding, those resources will definitely remain behind. COVID will end eventually. The resources will remain behind and could be used um, for, for HIV response. And, you know, I think one, one critical thing that we saw as the, as the region in Africa is the, the, the impact or the, the, the capacity that the region has in terms of resource mobilization, because we managed to actually mobilize resources within a short period of time, which is financial resources, which some, somehow most of African countries they were struggling to um, testing viral load because of it was said to be expensive, um, but we managed to actually have resources to actually look into how do we support COVID, which is actually a skill that we never knew that we have as, as the region. And um, I think last, lastly, um, the infrastructure that, especially with um, the skill that we actually managed as, as the region to actually prove that we have, because we had we managed to have um, COVID-19 uh, vaccines um, produced locally, you know, so we have scientists. And I remember one news and um, the variant, um, some, somehow I heard that South Africa was one of the countries that um, identified the one of the COVID-19 variant, which means we've got resources in the country that we, the skill, the expertise that we had as the country and the region that we never had. So there's a lot that we can learn and actually leverage on from the COVID-19 lessons. Thank you. Thank you, Mandita. Dr. Sisi, I will ask you the same question about what Uganda has learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and what can be, what is going to be kept or sustained after COVID in the HIV care and treatment um, world. Thank you, Obi. I think uh, the silver lining on COVID was to do things differently to achieve the same results. And uh, we had to make sure we reach all the patients. And I think uh, Dr. Olabanjo has already talked about the patient-centered 
uh, strategies, which were there, but maybe they were not as intensive as we had to make them to make sure that patients get their drugs. And uh, there were many strategies, uh, community distribution points, actually delivering drug using motorbikes to patients, and uh, also knowing that how can we do um, telemedicine in a way. So I think uh, these strategies, we need to keep the intensity and not stop because COVID is sort of going down if we are to reach the epidemic control that we are talking about. Um, my colleague there has talked about platforms for testing. Initially, tests became, they were so expensive and our government were not able to test everybody because it was over $60. Yet they had to open borders and you know, trade and economies had to sort of be sustained even when we had lockdowns. And we had to modify the platforms that we had to do testing, but we also had to think very differently. And for Uganda, this is the first time that there was major funding from government to scientists to provide solutions to COVID. And so we have groups that started to work on uh, COVID vaccines, but this is not just COVID vaccines. Now you have the resources, you have the know-how, you have the infrastructure, and you can work on vaccines for other diseases, including emerging diseases. We had to start working on diagnostics and our institution has developed a diagnostic for COVID. Initially, we were using the platform that we used for viral load. It has very low throughput, very high tech, removed from the population. Now we, we have developed a close to point of care platform. But this platform, even now as COVID goes down, we know that we can use the platform for other, for other diseases because the system or the processes are the same. You just change the primers for the uh, disease that you are looking at. We had local production of masks, sanitizers, and I think this will also help our economies. And we, we had to do this because we couldn't, first of all, we couldn't get vaccines initially. Every country that had their vaccines, it was for their population. So I think this is an eye opener that, yes, you have to use your brain, which we have. You have to um, put in place infrastructure and please look at research funded by our local uh, governments. And this research is not necessarily for COVID, but it also actually feeds into HIV. And we look around and we do all this testing. And where do we get all the kits for HIV testing 40, 40 years after the beginning of the epidemic? We import them. So why can't we make our own? I think this was really an eye opener. And uh, these are the things that remain not to just benefit COVID, but benefit HIV. And now, right now we are starting to roll out point of care viral load testing. Before we had centralized testing. So within COVID, when there were issues with transport and transporting samples to the centralized place. Now, when we look at, okay, we can do, um, even when we take drugs to the community, we can do point of care viral load testing in the communities because these are strategies that we have started to accelerate and we should keep the accelerator on because this is what will also help us with a control of the HIV epidemic. Mm. Thank you so much, Dr. CC. So I would, um, you talked um, about point of care testing, which I really like because I think Mandisha mentioned how the connection between viral load suppression and HIV drug resistance. And so right now we're seeing that a lot of countries are rolling out the um, integrated drug resistance, um, antiretroviral, sorry, integrated drugs, 
um, the, the new line of insidious drugs for HIV treatment. And we see that, at least for those drugs right now, there's very low levels of resistance if any, around the world. And so how can we ensure that those drugs actually stay active? Okay. Um, we have now, we've rolled out <clears throat> in many low and middle income countries, uh, Doltegravir or integrase based ART for first and second line. And uh, really the reason many people uh, looked at even uh, the recommendations came out was because there was high barrier to development of resistance to Doltegravir. It was relatively safe, except for the scare we got about neurotubal defects in, in newborns. Um, but it's well tolerated as, uh, as a drug. And so um, in Uganda, we, 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 like Nigeria, we continue to see continued viral load suppression. In those who are tested, and, uh, we, but we missed many people for testing. Those who are tested, we continue to see viral load suppression. But also there was um, at the same time an increase in the patients that were being enrolled onto adult gravia or integrase based uh, ART, both for first line and second line. And uh, the survey that we have done or the data that we have collected, and this is data that is taken from uh, patients in care. It's used both for surveillance, but also for managing the patients. We are still seeing very low levels of, of Delta Gravia resistance. This could be due to, uh, there may have been breaks in, uh, uh, in patients taking the drugs, but this drug maybe is very um, robust. And uh, for now, we have seen low resistance, but we need to continue the monitoring. I think the priority for any government in 2020, 2021 was not go to do drug resistance surveys. And um, so now as we come out of COVID, we need to continue to monitor. But the best way to prevent uh, resistance is adherence. So take the drugs to the patient and make sure they take it. That is the best prevention. Don't have a stockouts, uh, but is the alternative you are more forgiving? If you have some stock out, or if you don't take your drugs as you should, um, I don't know the exact answer. Maybe it is more forgiving. But in the long term, we need to continue as uh, governments, as uh, ministries of health, as program people, we need to continue monitoring and doing surveillance for drug resistance because we do not want to lose this beautiful drug. And um, we, we had to change in 2018 because of very high levels of uh, pretreatment drug resistance. We, have, we need to sustain and maintain this drug. We don't want to lose it. So programs need to uh, monitor, but at the same time put in place uh, strategies to prevent things that will lead to drug resistance. Like um, adherence is very critical. And uh, of course, some of the reasons that uh, we have breaks in treatment have to do with programs. If you don't have the drugs in the clinic, then patients won't go for them. If you have COVID and patients cannot go to the clinic, but you cannot also take drugs to them where they are, then there is a break. But also the patients, the beautiful, um, this it's just one tablet a day, at least for patients on first line and second line. So it's very convenient. And I think better adherence because of uh, also uh, less side effects. Uh, but we have to continue monitoring. We do not want to go back to a state where now we have to look for another alternative drug. I'm going to ask a question about what did not work well. So we talked about what worked well for countries. And so um, maybe I will ask Professor Carla, what did not work well? What should we drop? What should we continue? Well, uh, what not to do? This is a, the first point is not to allow barriers for patients to 
reach the sur health care services. It means to provide some conditions or in our situation, for instance, in my, my city is, a, is not a richest here in the, the, the country. It's a middle income, but in a low development region. We have many patients that did, could not come to medical visit or to take the refill, the artery field during the pandemic because they have no money to pay for transportation. So it is uh, very, very simple because uh, it costs about $2 to go and come back home, but uh, it's crucial for the patient. If you have no money to move to the, the healthcare service to take your medication, how can I ask the patient to take properly the, the, the drugs? So I believe, uh, do not forget that uh, you said uh, in my first uh, uh, response, you said that uh, what should be the points we need to solve. One of the points I guess is not to look uh, only for the infrastructure, but for the special needs of the patient, the specific needs, food, safety, transportation conditions. We have a, a program that uh, provides free access to uh, public transportation for HIV patients, but it's very bureaucratic to get the, 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 the authorization to use the, the, the service. And some patients do not know that uh, they have the right to a travel without pay for. So uh, I believe that these barriers could be uh, surpassed if you have a clear political willingness to provide a great access, a wide access for this kind of patient for the, the health service in general. I believe uh, the, main, the main policies are focus on uh, providing treatment, providing uh, testing, providing uh, referral centers. They are essential, but they, they are not the only important thing when we look at the HIV patient, especially because this part of the population usually is a, a poor population without access to education to minimal rights. So I guess do not, if, do not forget <laughs> Forgetting that this specific point would be an important uh, action to improve the, the, the access and the, the outcomes of this population in general, because we have free of cost antiretroviral therapy, we have a free of cost HIV testing, viral load, CD4 count, genotype, everything is free for this patient. But sometimes the small lacking point, missing point that uh, is how to move in the city long distance and getting the, the minimum uh, safety support for food support. So I believe we don't forget these minimal things, but they are crucial to guarantee uh, good success in facing the, any epidemic, not, not only AIDS, but any other that can that affect our country and many others. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Carlos. So people-centered care is a big message that we're hearing here today to so focus on what people need. And, you know, don't, like um, Dr. Okunshala was saying, that not all caps fit everyone. And so, um, Melissa, I would like you to talk about um, your experience as a person who's thriving um, with HIV, your your an example to the world and you know how are you um, pushing forward this idea of people-centered care through your work and you know a, just a brief um, talk about what you're doing to facilitate this and you know how you're working and really if you had to give a message to governments and to people working in this space what would it be? Um, thank you so much, Obi. Um, I think for, for the past 40 years, HIV services has been um, provider-centered. And that's one of the reasons why um, we're not seeing that we're not re reaping the fruits that we're supposed to. We, we're, doing, we're not doing bad, but at the same time, services, programs are decided for 
that are not decided with people with HIV. And for many years, I think we all know about the GIPA principle, greater involvement of people with HIV or meaningful involvement of people with HIV. I think for me, um, being um, here 20 years later after my diagnosis is because I've been meaningfully involved in my care. I've been taking decisions. I've known what is good for me, what is not good for me. I know when to remind blood to be taken. I, I know when to remind my clinician to actually give me my results back. So it's, 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 it's about people um, taking a center responsibility and leading their lives because we cannot run away from the fact that um, clinicians are decided for, and people with HIV, um, they are matured people, they are responsible people. Government should trust people with their own care. Don't decide for people, it's okay because clinicians and government know more most of the time, but the reasons they know more is because they are not sharing information with people. Um, changing treatment without telling a person, and you know as a clinician, for instance, in South Africa, there was a data that was just published recently um, that there is an, I think it's in most African countries, of course, that viral load testing, the viral load uptake is, is poor because um, we're depending on clinicians to decide when viral load must be done. And we decide on clinicians to know and remember when viral loads are done. And in Africa, one clinician has a, a queue of 50 clients. And while, while they're busy consulting with this particular client, they are called outside for an emergency. When they come back, uh, they are haphazard. They can't even remember that they're supposed to take my viral load. So what I normally advise clinicians and program managers is let the client know, if you are testing me today, tell me when the viral load will be due, 16 August, we are taking your viral load. I'm the one that should be looking forward to the 16th of August. And I should know the importance of taking treatment because also what I'm noticing, is that there is more on quantity over quality. Time is not spent with clients to explain the benefits of treatment. That's why we need, we're seeing a number of clients and you know not adhering to treatment. We're losing a lot of clients and the money that we're spending in procuring drugs is not actually um, giving us what we're supposed to get in. That's why as the region and probably most of the countries, we could not achieve the second 90. It's because some clients, they don't know the value of taking treatment. Time is not spent with client and that's a critical time when a client has just been diagnosed. I don't think I would be here if I never um, spoke and I never had the quality of HIV testing that I had after being diagnosed. And now I know the value of my treatment and I know the value to myself and I know the value in preventing transmission HIV to my children and to my husband. I'm married, um, I'm married to an HIV negative husband and we've got two beautiful HIV negative daughters because I know the value of me taking treatment and of me protecting transmission or transmitting HIV to my family, which is something that should be actually translated on be communicated to all HIV positive clients. And I don't think we'll be sitting here now um, to, uh, you know, pointing fingers at the certain government and um, that facility or health facility did not achieve this and that. It's not about clinicians, it's about clients. Let's trust clients to take responsibility and be at the center of the care and look at whether we'll be achieving. And I can assure you, come 2025 when we have, we have to measure the 95, 95, 95. If we can do what the, all the speakers are saying, patient-centered care, engaging patient, and let people with HIV to be at the center by 2025, I can assure you that we will achieve better results with that. Thank you so much, Mandita. Thank you so, so much for that. <laughs> so thank you so much to all our speakers today. Um, we're very grateful for your time um, and all the discussions we had today. We will try and put together just a compendium of everything that we have said, especially our recommendations, and it will be available for people on request. And so um, as we end today, we really want to say thank you on behalf of Femo Fisher Scientific and um, on behalf of all the groups that we've worked with tirelessly to put this together. So thank you and we will see you Again, hopefully soon, please reach out for questions um, for our audience, please reach out. We'll have an email and you can go to our booth at the conference um, if you have questions as well. Thank you.